Hey, hey, welcome everyone. This is our training on the changes that were made to the child care minimum standards in August and September of 2024. It will be helpful if you have a copy of the most recent minimum standards available to you. Make sure that you have the one that has September 2024 on the cover. That is the most recent version that we have received. Before we get started, let's go over some tips to help you be successful with today's training. First off, you need to know that all of the changes that were made in the minimum standards are due to bills that were passed in our 88th legislative session. So it did take a little bit of time for these changes to make it actually into the standards, but they are in effect now. Like I said earlier, make sure that you have a copy of your child care minimum standards available to reference to and take notes accordingly. If you have any questions about the material that we're going over today, you can always reach out to me or any member of my office staff at timthetrainer.com. In the upper right hand corner of our website, you can reach out to us with any questions that you have or if you're needing additional information beyond the scope of the training material and we can respond to you in a timely manner to meet those needs. Be prepared to answer questions um, on your online worksheet. So you'll notice in the upper right hand corner of the slide, there are yellow boxes with some questions. You're going to see all of these questions um, on the online worksheet. So we're trying to help you out. So once again, you can be successful here. As we continue to uh, move forward with training and professional development, I just also want to remind you that the total number of clock hours that you complete in a single day should not exceed the number of hours that you work. All right, since time spent in meetings and trainings should be compensated, the number of training hours that you complete should never go over the number of hours that you worked in that day. Definitely, when you are completing trainings and professional development, the total number of clock hours completed in one single day cannot exceed the number of hours that there are in a day which is 24, all right? So keep that in mind. Once again, we want you to be successful. We don't want you to run into issues with childcare regulation and definitely don't want you to run into wage and hour issues with Texas Workforce Commission. Make sure that your TechPeds ID is entered on your Tim the Trainer profile. That way, whenever you complete this course, your training certificate will automatically be uploaded into your TechPeds account. You can do that on your profile on timthetrainer.com need to make sure that that is done before you complete the training. If you do it after the training, then it will not be uploaded. The learning objectives that I have for this particular training are listed here. We're going to have a comprehensive understanding of parent rights outlined in the child care minimum standards and how to comply with these on a daily basis. We're also going to be talking quite a bit in this training today about water safety and the new training requirements for individuals that are accompanying, ch accompanying children um, at swimming pools or during water activities. And then lastly, we'll understand the expectations that a child care center has when they receive a court order on a child that is enrolled in your program. All right, let's go ahead and get started. The first few changes that we saw in the child care minimum standards in 2024 uh, applies to terms and definitions. You're going to see here number 30 um, where it talks about grounds. Um, they have put a bigger focus on what is considered grounds and premises. So you can see here that grounds are um, any land that is located at the child care center, such as the building, other structures, body of water play equipment, streets, sidewalks, walkways, driveways, parking garages, etc. Also known as premises. All right, they're, what they're really wanting to focus on right here is that things that are allowed or things that are prohibited um, at the child care center include the entire premises. So for an example, when it talks about the use of tobacco products or smoking cigarettes or e-cigarettes, that is prohibited on your premises. And that includes the parents of the children that are enrolled in your program. So if, a, if you have a parent that has an e-cigarette or a vape or a cigarette, um, old timey cigarette, um, you know, once they pull into your parking lot or they're on your sidewalk, 
they they should not have that tobacco product all right so you want to make sure that you're outlining this in your parent handbook make sure that you're going over this during parent orientation so that they have a clear understanding that they have to finish their tobacco products before they enter your premises the next change that we see right here is when it comes to sanitizing um, this was a pretty big change actually when it talks about the definition of sanitizing, um, it says that you can use a bleach rela uh, related product or you can use a product that has been approved by the Environmental Protection Agency. It is, uh, has a registration number on the bottle. And the most important part is that the uh, product has labeling instructions for sanitizing or disinfecting. And that's where the change comes in right here. Prior to this update, it just said instructions for sanitizing. So if it only had instructions for disinfecting, it technically was not accepted by child care regulations. They have changed that now to where it says sanitizing or disinfecting. So that's going to make it a lot easier for all of you to find products to do your sanitizing and disinfecting in your program. Just make sure that on those labeling instructions, it does have the sanitizing or disinfecting, okay? And just a reminder, if you are using a, a bleach product instead of an alternate chemical, then you do have the five-step process right here. Uh, wash it with water and soap, rinse it with clear water, soak it or spray it with that bleach solution for at least two minutes, rinse it with cool water, okay? And then allow it to air dry. But those five steps are only needed if you're using a bleach product. If you're using an alternate chemical that has been approved by the Environmental Protection Agency, then you're going to follow the labeling instructions. The next thing is the definition of a swimming pool. All right, now the definition of a swimming pool has always been in the minimum standards. But what has changed right here is the depth. Previously, a swimming pool was defined as a body of water um, greater than two feet. It is now defined as a body of water that is 18 inches or more. All right. So and then when you look at wading pool, wading pool is going to be less than 18 inches. So the change here is it went from 18 or it went from 24 inches to 18 inches. All right. So keep that in mind right there. Also, when it talks about on number 63, the definition of water activities, okay, a water activity is related to the use of swimming pools, wading pools, or sprinkler play. Where you're going to see this again is when we get to the enrollment form, and it says you must have permission for, from the parent or guardian for a child to participate in water activities. So that would include swimming, wading pools, or sprinkler play or a splash pad, okay? There's a lot of differences between the swimming pool and the water activity that we'll talk about as we continue to go through this. All right, next we're gonna go over to operating policies. And under operating policy, a new policy that you are required to have, you can see here is 20, the parent's rights. You can actually download this document from Child Care Regulations website and you can hand, put that in your enrollment packet or you can cut it and paste it right into your parent handbook. Your parents' rights must be consistent with the rules and the minimum standards. So a center cannot alter these uh, parent rights. Um, even if it, if it, you know, your beliefs or your convictions or your philosophy uh, may contradict what's in the parent rights, you don't have the ability to make those changes. So the parent rights have to be exactly as listed um, in the standards. My suggestion to y'all is once again, just cut and paste this right into the minimum standards. Easy breezy. There's no reason to reinvent the, mill, uh, reinvent the wheel right here. What are the parent rights? Well, listed here are the parent rights. Many of the items that you're gonna see over the next few slides, you've seen before. It's been in the standards. It's just written a little bit differently now and a little bit of a different format, okay? 
So basically, uh, the parent has a right to enter and examine the center at any time without prior notice. So you have to have that open door policy so that parents can come into your school. Also, in the state of Texas, everyone has a right to file a complaint with a state agency without retaliation. So in this case right here, the parent does have a right to file a complaint against your school. They also have a right to review any publicly accessible record. So any document that is made public, they obviously has a right to review that. They have a right to review your center's written records concerning that the parent's particular child. They do, once again, have a right to review your child care regulation inspection reports or investigations. And then we have to let them know how they can access that either by you posting your inspection or most recent investigation in a prominent area so that they can view it. Um, the parent may request a copy of the inspection from the center director, but the most popular way of meeting this standard is to simply give them the instructions in the parent handbook on how to access compliance history online. All of those are acceptable right there. Here's something else that, um, I, in my opinion, I think this is really good that they have added this to the minimum standards. Once again, this isn't anything new, but it's something new to the standards to help back you up and to help support you. All right. So some of this information is meant to be helpful, not hurtful. All right. But anytime you do have a family that has a court order that is signed by a judge, that is either preventing another biological parent from accessing that child or limiting access uh, for a particular biological parent, um, you must comply with the court order, all right? So remember, a parent cannot change a court order. The only person that can change a court order is a judge, okay? So whenever a parent does bring in that court order, must be following it exactly as written. The way I like to do this is on your enrollment form. You know, um, biological parents' name, address, and telephone numbers, you know, child's name and, and birth date. Is there a court order on file for this child circle, yes or no? I like to make this a yes or no question on the enrollment form. And then if you circle yes, a certified copy of the court order must be attached. All right? And I would suspend enrollment until you get that. If they say that there is a court order on file, child doesn't start until you get a copy of the court order. That's what I recommend for you right there, okay? Um, I do have a training on my website that goes over custody issues. If you want more information on custody or court orders, um, you might wanna check that training out right there. And then also number seven, uh, we must provide the parent uh, contact information for child care regulations. All right, now here's the big one, okay? So I uh, really wanna make sure everyone understands number eight because this is being misinterpreted quite a bit out there, all right? But if you have cameras in your classroom, okay, then the parent has a right to review any video recordings of an alleged incident of abuse and neglect, okay? So the only thing that is listed right here is video recordings of an alleged incident of abuse and neglect. That's what they have a right to view. If they just don't like something that happened in the classroom or they wanna see behaviors in the classroom, that's not gonna be covered here, okay? So you can go ahead and stick to your typical policy that you have, whether you allow parents to see video footage or not. Um, whether that video footage is for surveillance purposes only, you can go ahead and continue following the policy like you always have. This one right here is only for abuse and neglect allegations. You might want to look in the Texas Administrative Code at the actual definition of abuse and neglect to kind of help you, you know, have a good platform on this one right here, okay? Now again, if you don't have video footage, if you don't have cameras in your classroom, or if the video footage is no longer available, all right? If it's no longer available or if it's not available, then you're not gonna get in trouble for that, okay? 
Um, I know most of our uh, recording devices only hold data for, you know, seven to 10 days. So once it's gone, it's gone, all right? Now, if you've saved it to a thumb drive or you've saved a clip on your computer, that's still available, okay? Um, also, the parent is not allowed to retain any portion of the video clip when there are other children in that video clip, okay? Um, you're also going to notice right here that you must notify in writing uh, the parents of the other children that are in that video clip, uh, video clip before allowing the parent to inspect the video recording, okay? Now, where the misconception is on this one is you'll see right here on C as in cat, you must notify in writing the parents of any other child captured in the video clip. It's not get permission from the other families. You just have to notify them that you're gonna be showing this video clip that in includes their child, okay? Now, the other side of this one is that as soon as you notify the other families of you know, a parent wanting to see a video clip, that's going to create curiosity and the other families are then going to want to see it. So, um, you know, it can definitely create a little bit of a mess right there. Okay. Um, all right, let's go ahead and move on right here. Again, the parent has a right to um, obtain your center policies. Uh, so you want to make sure that that parent handbook is really well written and that they always have access to that. So they're giving a parent uh, a copy of the parent handbook upon enrollment, and then it's easily accessible to them, you know, after enrollment right there. They also have a right to review your staff training records. All right, so they can see what kind of training that your um, employees are getting and your curriculum that you're using. They have a right to review that, okay? Um, and I, I know a couple of people got, um, you know, a little upset over this one right here. I don't think it's that big of a deal. I think that when you show families your employee training records, it's probably going to put them at ease that your employees are getting um, really good training and they're getting a lot of training. Um, probably going to make them more comfortable than create other issues right there. And like I said earlier, um, you can't retaliate against a parent for any of these actions. These are their rights and you can't treat them differently um, if they exercise them. All right, so that's what we've got on parent rights right there. Let's go ahead and move on now to uh, swimming. On your admissions form, uh, you must get permission for children to participate in water activities, all right? If you are allowing a child access to a swimming pool, the parent must also indicate, and this is where you're probably gonna to have to make changes to your enrollment form so that you're, you'll be in compliance. Whether you make these changes to your enrollment form or you can play, uh, create a completely different document, whatever works best for you. But not only must you get permission for the child to participate in water activities, um, they also have to document whether the child can swim competently as outlined by the American Red Cross or if the child requires a personal flotation device, um, if they are unable to swim competently or if the child is at risk of injury or death when swimming or accessing a body of water. All of that needs to be included in this permission now, so that's quite a bit of information. That's on the enrollment form. We're gonna come back to swimming uh, um, and water activities here in just a little bit. On personnel records, all right, and this went into effect September 1st of 2023. So once again, took about a year for this to actually get into the minimum standards, but it's here now. We have two different affidavits that must be completed by your employees. The new one is the pre-employment affidavit for applicants, and this needs to be completed before you hire them. So basically, when you hand an applicant um, the job application, you need to also be handing them the pre-employment affidavit for applicants, all right? So, or, or if someone brings you a resume, you hand this document to them whenever they give you the resume. 
Um, this one does not have to be notarized. So the pre-employment affidavit for applicants does not have to be notarized. Now the other affidavit that we've had for, you know, 25 years, that one still requires um, to be notarized. So a little bit of a difference on this one. So again, there are two different affidavits that we're going to be collecting from employees now. Once again, um, where it talks about the minimum qualifications for employees, same thing right here, the pre-employment affidavit for um, applicants. And again, this has to be done before you hire them. Now, if you have employees that have worked at your facility prior to September 2023, then they are grandfathered and you're not required to have this document. But this document is required for anyone that you hired after September 1st, 2023. All right, let's move on now into training and professional development. So what has been added with training and professional development is water safety training. All right. So if you are taking a child to a swimming pool, either at your location or off site, there are now training requirements for this. You must have annual training on water safety. This has to be completed by the child care center director of the facility that is allowing a child to access a swimming pool. And it also must be completed by each employee who is accompanying a child to a swimming pool at or away from the center. Okay. So this needs to be done once again by the director and the employees that are involved in that uh, swimming activity. If you're not taking children to swimming pools, all right, then you don't have to comply with this. The other big one right here, and I want to make sure everyone clearly understands this, is your annual training on water safety is excluded of other training requirements, all right? So think of it like your transportation safety training that is in addition to your annual training requirements. So water safety is gonna be the same thing, all right? So water safety training does not count towards annual training hours. It is a completely separate expectation. This one is going to talk about when a director is allowed to train their staff. Um, again, this has always been in the minimum standards. A director has always had the ability to train their own staff, um, but they've added a couple of things right here. Um, a director may not train their own staff if they have been placed on probation or suspended or their license has been revoked. All right. Uh, within two years of doing the training, um, then at that point, that director would not be able to train their staff. Also, you're going to see here that if your center has received an administrative penalty, all right, within the last two years, if the, the director was the director at the time of the administrative penalty being assessed, then you would not be able to train your own staff. If you did receive a administrative penalty, but the director has changed and the new director was not in that position when the administrative penalty was assessed, then they would be able to train their staff. All right. So that's a pretty big clarification right there. Um, that's going to be really helpful for quite a few folks. All right. All right, once again, um, this is, this. like I said, some of these things pop up uh, a few times in the standards right here, and I'm just kind of going in order uh, uh, throughout the book right here. But the additional training that employees and the, the director must have uh, when accessing a swimming pool, we've kind of already gone over this right here, but you can see once again where it's listed under 1325, kind of the same information. Uh, and again, you'll see on, on C as in cat, that water safety training is exclusive of any requirement for orientation, pre-service, or annual training hours. Right here under 1403, um, it's going to address uh, substitutes, volunteers, and contractors. 
So a lot of times during the summertime when we're going on field trips, you'll have parent volunteers that will come assist, all right? If you have a volunteer that is assisting with a swimming field trip, they're gonna be accompanying children to a swimming pool, then that volunteer must also have the water safety training before they go on that swimming field trip. With all of these changes to swimming and water activities, we're just gonna see some clarification with the language on child staff ratios. So you can see 1801, when you are taking children on a field trip, they've just clarified a little bit of the language right there. You can see your child staff ratios listed accordingly. Same thing under 2101, where it talks about ratios for water activities, all right? Now again, this has been, this is where the big change right here is the definition of a water activity, the definition of a wading pool versus the definition of a swimming pool. So this is where it went from the 24 inches to the 18 inches. So a wading pool is a body of water that is less than 18 inches. A swimming pool is a body of water greater than 18 inches and you can see the applicable child staff ratio for those right there. If there is no body of water, then you, you use normal classroom ratios. So if you have a splash pad or you're doing sprinkler play and there is no body of water, then you just follow normal classroom ratios. But if there is the body of water, you're gonna uh, look at 2101, and then also look at 2105, the child staff ratios for swimming. And again, swimming is now a body of water 18 inches or greater. With all of this being said, um, had to do a little bit of clarification on the certified lifeguard. Um, you must have a certified lifeguard on duty when the children are swimming in more than 18 inches of water. Um, again, the change right here is it changed from the 24 inches to the 18 inches, all right? And y'all, I want y'all to look at 2113, all right? Because I think this is huge. I think this is so incredibly important that if you are taking children swimming, then the adults that are accompanying the children, so the teachers or the volunteers that are on that field trip, must be able to swim and they must be prepared to do so in an emergency. So you should not be taking teachers on a field trip who don't know how to swim. That's pretty big right there, y'all. Um, they're going to have to assist in an emergency. You're gonna see this once again here in just a little bit as well. Same thing with the volunteers, like I mentioned, when you look at 2115, all right, if you have a volunteer that is going to assist uh, with that field trip to the swimming pool, they must be able to swim and prepared to do so in the event of an emergency. On 3701, we talk about safety precautions. Uh, so again, um, all areas accessible to a child must be free from hazards including the following. So all bodies of water, wading pools, hot tubs, bird baths, fountains, buckets, and rain barrels are inaccessible to children, okay? Not much change right there. It was basically some language that was changed, but nothing really new. You should be uh, familiar with this one right here. All right, we're gonna shift gears just a little bit. We're gonna talk about release of children. All right, so who may you release a child to? Um, child must be released to the biological parent or a designated person. What you're gonna see added right here is B as in boy, upon the receipt of a valid court order signed by a judge, you're gonna follow that court order. Okay, so we saw it earlier in the standards, now we're seeing it once again with release of children. When you do receive that court order, all right, uh, you want to look at the expiration date, make sure that it hasn't expired. 
and then make sure you maintain a copy of that court order in the child's confidential file, okay? So this information is shared on a need-to-know basis only. This is not something that is public information. We're going to go back to um, active play equipment right here. All right. So if you're using inflatables, all right, so like an inflatable swimming pool, or you're using one of those water slides that have the pool at the bottom of it, that's a body of water. Okay. Um, so yes, you are allowed to use those inflatables as long as they comply with all the requirements in the child care minimum standards. Okay. Uh, you're probably going to have a hard time with this one because a lot of the inflatables aren't going to meet all of the requirements, but you may be able to find something right here. This is where it's going to get really detailed on the water safety that has to be followed. Um, so you can see here that whether, whether you have a swimming pool at your facility or you're taking children swimming off-site, the following must be met right here. You must have a minimum of two life-saving devices that are available, okay? If you are taking them to a swimming pool that is greater than 2,000 square feet in water surface, you must have one additional life-saving device for every 2,000 square feet of water space, okay? So if you are taking them to a public pool or a water park, you're probably going to need to do some homework before you go um, and you know find out how big how large those swimming pools are and then make sure that those um, applicable uh, water saving or, or life saving devices are available okay and it's going to be your responsibility to make sure that you're in compliance with this it's not going to be the swimming pool or the water parks responsibility it's going to be your responsibility to make sure that you're in compliance here same thing with looking at number three, drain gates must be in place, they must be in good repair and must not be able to be removed without tools. Uh, pool chemicals and pumps are inaccessible to children. Uh, machine rooms must be locked anytime a child is present. Um, employees that are going on the field trip must be able to clearly see all parts of the swimming area. The bottom of the swimming pool must be visible at all times. And an adult needs to be able to turn off the pump or filtering system anytime the child is in the pool in the event of an emergency. And then all indoor and outdoor areas must be free of furniture and equipment that a child could use to scale a fence or release a lock. All right, now I kind of went over that really quickly right there. If you go to my, my website, timthetrainer.com, I do have a training on water safety that is up and ready for you to take. And we go into a lot more detail on these items in that water safety training. Now again, um, if you are taking your children to a swimming pool off site, okay, or a water park, you're gonna need to do some homework. You're probably going to want to visit that swimming pool before the field trip to make sure that all of this criteria is met. Also, in addition, when you look at 5009, other safety precautions that you must follow, all right? Before a child uh, who is unable to swim competently or is at risk of injury or death, they must be provided with a type one, two, or three United States Coast Guard approved personal flotation device. Y'all, there are five different classifications of uh, personal flotation devices that are approved by the United States Coast Guard. Type one, type two, and type three are the only ones that we are allowed to use. So it's gonna be your responsibility Okay, both the director and the employees that are on these uh, field trips to make sure that that child has the appropriate uh, personal flotation device that meets these guidelines. Just because the parent sends in the life jacket doesn't mean it's going to be an approved one. All right. So, you know, when they come in with that door, the Explorer life jacket, you're going to need to look and, you know, the, the inside of it 
and make sure that it's a type one, two, or three um, United States Coast Guard approved um, flotation device. All right. And you've got to make sure that the child is wearing the personal flotation device and make sure that it is properly fitted and fastened. All right. So these are really important right here too. And that the personal flotation device is in good repair. I, I can tell you lots of stories where parents have sent in um, life jackets and they were, you know, two sizes too big. Um, the kid looked like a turtle, you know, um, or the opposite. It's way too small. You can't, you can't fasten it. So it's going to be the director and the employee's responsibility to make sure that you have the proper personal flotation device when um, it meets this criteria right here. If you are in a situation where you do have a swimming pool or you're taking the children to have swimming lessons um, while the child is receiving their swimming lessons or uh, swim instruction, they are not required to wear the personal flotation device during um, instruction time or competition time. Um, that might be applicable to some of you. Um, but just for normal swimming play, um, you would need to, meet, need to meet the criteria for the personal flotation devices. Under 5013, it's going to talk about the safety requirements for wading pools. So if you have the little uh, wading pool that you get from Walmart or Big Lots for the children to splash around in, um, it needs to make sure that it's being stored out of the children's reach when it's not in use. Uh, make sure that it is drained at least daily and sanitized. This is where a lot of people get cited right here. And they need to be stored in a way that they don't hold water. Okay, because that gets really nasty right there. And then last but not least right here, can a child swim in a body of water other than a swimming pool? All right. You must not allow a child to swim in a body of water other than a swimming pool that complies with the rules in the child care minimum standards. So if you have a small lake or a pond that is located on the property of your school, they would not be able to swim in that. Okay, so it has to be the swimming pool. All right, so that's it, y'all. Um, those are the changes in the child care minimum standards for 2024. So we talked about parent rights, we talked about water safety and water safety training requirements. We talked about court orders. Those are the three big things right there. Uh, the pre-employment um, affidavit for applicants added that in there, um, but that's it, okay? Uh, stay tuned because we do have a very active legislative session that is coming up. I am anticipating a lot of activity um, around child care and minimum standards um, and, and everything in between. Uh, so make sure you're following me on Facebook or Instagram, Tim the Trainer, and I will keep you up to date on everything that's going on in the child care industry. Thank you so much for completing this training with me today. Um, once you get done watching the video, you will complete your online worksheet so that you can get your certificate of completion. Make sure that your TechPeds ID is in your portal um, on timthetrainer.com before you complete the training. So that way your certificate will automatically be uploaded into your TechPeds account. All right, everyone. Thanks a lot. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.